My theory is simple. AI companies are running out of high quality training data. And humanists, historians, archivists, librarians, experts, intellectuals hold the key to solving this problem. If you're new here, I'm Shay. I'm a PhD candidate at Harvard and I have a free series here on YouTube called Critical Thinking in the age of AI. Comment below where you're tuning in from and how AI is currently impacting your work. And be sure to subscribe while you're at it so I can keep making more educational videos like this. Now, I'm a PhD candidate in the humanities, history specifically, so you're probably wondering why did I venture into the AI industry? Well, it's very simple. I'm nosy. No, but on a serious note, the death of the humanities has been an ongoing narrative for decades. But as a humanities scholar and a proud recipient of a liberal arts education, I've always seen immense value in humanistic inquiry. It's why I'm teaching critical thinking in the age of AI here on YouTube and why I created Analog Social, a media and wellness venture for deep thinkers. And our motto at Analog Social is, we're thinkers So while the news headlines were filled with doom, gloom, and fear about AI, I wanted to understand how the technology and the industry works so I could regain some sense of hope and agency about our collective AI future. Because this is going to impact nearly every community and every person, so we should all learn about how it works at the very least. In order to understand my AI collapse thesis slash theory, you have to understand the different kinds of data that these companies train on. I split it into about five different categories, and I'm going to explain them now. Okay, the first category of data is real-time sensory data. So think about robots, self-driving cars, smart thermostats, smart watches, anything with sensors. These machines constantly collect new data in real time. Heart rates, traffic patterns, micro movements in factories, even how fast you're typing. Now, for the AI industry, some pros are it's fresh, always updating, and extremely valuable for prediction and automation. But there are also some cons. It's limited in scope. For example, robots only understand the physical environment that they can measure. It can't teach AI philosophy, law, or cultural nuance. This data is really good at running machines, but not necessarily making them wise. The second category of data is public internet data. This is stuff we all see every day. Websites, social media posts, memes, Reddit, threads, online reviews, the vast amount of information that exists on the internet. Now, here's some pros for the AI industry. There's a lot of it and it's pretty easy to scrape. But here's some cons. AI companies have pretty much already used all of it. It can be pretty repetitive, biased, just a little bit basic, low quality. A good chunk of what's written on the internet is read and written about a sixth to eighth grade level. So that's easy and digestible to understand on the go. And when you really think about it, the internet is really good at telling you how to clean your oven, not how to discover a new theory or digest a complex theoretical problem. I like to think of it as the fast food of data. It's cheap and available everywhere, but not so good for LLMs to train on. The third category of data is proprietary enterprise data. This includes things like hospital records, internal company documents, bank transactions, and government databases, amongst other things. Now, pros for the AI industry. It's structured, private, and a bit more trustworthy than random internet content. But here are some cons. It's locked away. Companies don't want to give away their competitive advantage to AI firms. It's already a big deal when someone leaks the recipe to KFC chicken or Coca-Cola's formulas. This data is really powerful, but expensive, and of course, I know there are many ways that people are trying to access this internal private data. The fourth category of data is synthetic data. Because human data is running out, AI companies are now using AI to generate new data to train other AI models. Yeah, so basically AI is teaching AI. Now, here is a pro. It's cheap to produce, but there is are some cons. It can lead to a feedback loop and AI ends up learning from its own artificial output instead of the real world and from real human beings who are very complex. It's sort of like making photocopies of photocopies. The quality degrades over time. This is one of the biggest reasons why experts believe we're heading towards AI model collapse, which I'll talk about more later in this video. And the fifth category of data 
is what I call analog data or analog expertise data. I argue that this is the rarest and highest value data that companies could possibly access. This is the kind of data that doesn't exist online. In fact, the vast amount of human wisdom, knowledge, genius, and creativity throughout our entire existence is not yet digitized. It lives in handwritten notebooks, archival collections, personal journals, oral histories, letters, field research, expert interviews, and private conversations. It's a kind of knowledge that comes from decades of lived experience or deep study. It's important to remember that there are so many different kinds of archives. There are medical archives, legal archives, personal archives, business archives, fashion archives. Everyone should really be keeping an archive. So what are some pros? It's original, it's contextual, and often the only record of high-level human intelligence. And with some archives, they'll be old enough that there are no copyright claims on them. But of course, there are some cons. It's hard to access and even harder to interpret, which is exactly why it's so valuable. And I also want to add that there are oftentimes provenance and access issues that often have to be worked out as well. So every archive has a list of instructions on what can be shared, what cannot be shared, what can be copied, what cannot be copied. And the original owners of certain parts of an archive may have claims to how it's used or copyright claims. So I just want to make that part clear as well. Every archive is different. There are institutional archives. There are small archives. There are personal family archives. There's so many different kinds of archives which have their own rules of access. And trust me, as a historian, I have seen various levels of access and it can be very complicated to sift through all of those. Also, digitization is very expensive and new methodologies for digitizing and tagging and getting the right metadata still needs to be advanced as well. But the point I'm making is that this is the data that teaches judgment, ethics, creativity, interpretation, and wisdom. It's what separates human intelligence from machine intelligence. If you're enjoying this video so far, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe so I can keep making educational videos like this. Okay. So what is the central problem that I am addressing here? AI companies have scraped the majority of the data that exists on the internet. And what they scraped is pretty low quality. Also, there are reports that have come out that show that more and more people are producing AI-generated content. So that means AI is eating up its own generated content. I know people don't like the use of the word AI slob. <laughs> Some of it is AI slob. But yeah, when a vast majority of what's being produced on the internet, which is what AI companies have access to, is AI-generated content, then you have a potential for model collapse because AI is recursively training on itself and not the vast amount of human genius, creativity, intelligence, and data. Now we have to remember what makes humans humans are the fact that they evolve, they learn, they grow. In order for LLM to continue to evolve and grow and to capture the complexity of human intelligence, it needs access to that. In 2022, researchers at Epoch AI, a nonprofit AI research institute, have researched extensively on the data scarcity problem. And they have noted that AI companies will run out of high quality training data by the middle of the decade. By some estimates, for example, in Ethan Mollock's book, Co-Intelligence, he predicts that by 2026, these AI companies will definitely run out of high quality training data. Estimates vary. The fact of the matter is that high quality domain expertise data, so things that make up a dissertation, make up the highest levels of expert knowledge, is getting harder and harder to access. You can't just scrape it on the internet. So data scarcity means that AI companies have been turning to expensive licensing deals. Here are some examples. Wiley, one of the world's largest academic publishers, disclosed a $44 million AI partnership deal. Taylor & Francis, another major academic publisher, projected a estimated $75 million AI rights deal. And News Corp signed a multi-year arrangement with a major AI company that was reportedly worth up to $250 million 
dollars. In 2024, Microsoft announced support for the establishment of Harvard Law School Library's new institutional data initiative. According to the official Microsoft announcement, it will work alongside other knowledge institutions to increase access to knowledge and high quality data for all builders of AI. The announcement goes on to say that the institutional data initiative will work with library, academic, and government institutions across the world to unlock and refine high quality data, starting with collections at Harvard Law School's library. Okay, so now you're probably wondering, what is my source of optimism as everyone's talking about an impending AI bubble? Well, one of my first college internships was actually as a knowledge management intern. My job was to track intellectual property records and documents of the organization that I was interning with. It taught me that the hard part about knowledge isn't storage. It's context, consent, and curation. In the current AI rush, those problems have been amplified. I don't think we really have a technology shortage. I think we have a governance shortage. Who owns what? Who can license what? And how do we rebuild trust after years of scraping without clear accountability or consent about what all this means in practice? If high quality data is scarce and valuable, we will need new entry-level jobs in digitization, cataloging, metadata, conservation, and rights management. These are jobs I would love to see because we need to get people working, get people employed, and make sure they can provide for themselves and for their families. I also believe that we'll need contracts that compensate creators, knowledge workers, and institutions for licensing and processes that make opting in or opting out meaningful. We'll need archivists and historians at the table designing ethical workflows that surface context instead of stripping them away. None of this requires believing that AI is going to replace us. It requires recognizing that original human thought, lived experiences, and historically grounded interpretation are the last great moats in the information economy, and that these moats are dug and maintained by humanists. The humanities are not dying. They're just undervalued and underutilized. This is why I believe humanists should be paid just as much as technologists. They have really valuable skills and access to information and data that is incredibly valuable and incredibly hard to access. When so many people are offloading their critical thinking skills and critical writing skills to generative AI, those who can think and write for themselves, drum up new ideas, have ingenuity, have innovation, think beyond the limits of what we can currently do, those are the ones who will stand out. So in the aftermath of any AI bubble, I hope we can all come together and include more stakeholders, especially humanists, in building a human-centered, human-aligned AI future. I'm optimistic that more and more people will return to the humanities, will remember and desire and crave what it means to be human in the age of AI. We are creative, meaningful, unique beings. And I don't want us to lose that in the race for AI. Now is the time for an AI renaissance. Staying in tune with our unique human abilities and qualities is important now more than ever. Okay, I know there's a lot here, but I want this to be overall a really optimistic take on what our AI future could possibly look like. Be sure to subscribe to my channel so you can continue to learn about AI from a humanistic perspective. As always say, Long live the humanities and stay human. See you next time.